welcome to the Gig Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Meckler. Today, we've got Sam Greenfield on the show. Sam is a saxophone player, writer, producer, singer, multi-instrumentalist, boasting nearly 100,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. He tours and records with Corey Wong and was recently seen on a Tiny Desk show with Ed Sheeran and just released another album under his name that explores modern funk and pop sensibilities along with a healthy dose of humor. Sam and I got to work together a little on the Wong and Cos collaboration, The Golden Hour. I'm really excited to have him here. Please welcome to the podcast, Sam Greenfield. <sighs> I got to get you to do that at my shows, man. Yeah, right. Get a little bit of entry uh, entry talk down. Good. That was the best intro I've ever had. Woo! So you're in you're in the UK. What are you doing? Were you over there with Wong recently? Uh, I'm actually not on Wong's UK and Europe run, but Phoebe and I are together, and she is from here. Uh, Phoebe Cadis, yeah. um, who ironically we met with Wong. Um, so we both had a crazy few months in New York and just decided to decompress out here for a little bit. Awesome. That's great. So are you at like a cabin or something or somebody's house? Is it, Or you rented yeah, something? We're, we're actually staying at her folks' house. Oh, cool. Yeah, but That's it's really awesome. nice. We're like out in the countryside, lots of sheep, lots of horses and open fields. It's nice. That's great. That does sound like decompression. It's awesome, man, dude. I saw, yeah. uh, I saw recently. I was just, I'm not like su- hyper fanboying, but like I'm following your stuff and I'm following what Wong's doing. And I saw that the haircut on stage moment that seemed hilarious and epic. What, what, what? Tell me about how that happened. Yeah, that was that was definitely fun. Um, so my friend Greg Rosen, shout out to Greg Rosen. Um, he actually is an amazing trumpet player, but he also has his barber license. So he lives in Philly, which is where I'm from. So we were in Philly and he hit me up and he was like, hey, man, like, do you think if I brought all my haircutting equipment to the show, the the band would want some haircuts? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's like the first thing people want on tour. Yeah. Um, so he showed up, but I went back to my parents for the day to spend the day with them. So I wasn't able to get a haircut. So by the time I got back to the venue, it was too late to get one, but he was still there. And Corey being the spontaneous person that he is was like, yo, Sammy, how would you feel about getting a haircut during the show? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah. (laughs) I was wondering if that was a long idea or, or, uh, or how that came together. That seems like, uh, that's, that's like a great bit. I saw that you were like, you were like, I had to be so still while I was <laughs> playing my parts. I'm usually grooving. I yeah. Be so still. <laughs> well, the whole uh, concept was, I'm going to get a haircut, but nobody's allowed to acknowledge the fact that I'm getting a haircut. So it has to just seem like nobody can react. Nobody can say anything. I just have to pretend like it's not even happening. That's amazing. Um, and of course, I didn't want it to come out badly. So I tried to stay as still as I could, but... Yeah, he definitely he definitely had to touch it up after the show. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so man, you know you have a lot of that sort of stuff in your music, the like humorous aspects, right? This is, this is like an aspect of comedy. Is is comedy a big influence on you? Was it like you started playing with Wong and you sort of saw how he was doing his, how he was packaging packaging his thing, and it was like influences from multiple places? Like how did that start to come together in your music? Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a number of factors, a mixture of things for sure. Um, I've always loved comedy. Um, Stand up comedy is one of my favorite forms of art, um, just because you're so exposed and you really can't hide behind anything. Yeah. So it's it's a really special form of art that I've always loved. So I figured that I would like to incorporate that in my artistry because I feel like a lot of people feel like they need to be their artist self and then who they are as a person is separate from who they are as an artist. And in my opinion, who you are as an artist or who you are as a person is your art. Yeah. So I was like, you know, if I'm going to do this solo career, then the solo music thing, I'm going to have to bring some sort of comedic element into it. Um, And then, yeah, seeing how Corey packages his, thing is really inspirational um the fact that i mean it's it's hard enough to get people to enjoy instrumental jazz fusion (laughs) because it's not not the most accessible form of music especially to non-musicians yeah so but there's if there's one thing everybody likes to do it's laugh so if you can bring a comedic element to your music then 
you can maybe access a group of people that you wouldn't be able to ordinarily get to. Right, right. I, you know, I was reading a, a interview you gave recently. I don't know what it was, a, a saxophone magazine or something. Maybe it was 2020, 2021 Oh, yeah, something. yeah. And you talked a little bit about, uh, you talked a little bit about like Lewis Cole and Snarky Puppy and Thundercat and Kamasi being like this sort of modern brand of jazzish stuff that uh, is more accessible. So you're kind of touching on that now. Um, I had this as a question kind of like later in the conversation, but I feel like since we're talking about it, um, you know, one of the things that I love about about your music and, and, and about Thundercats music and about Lewis Cole's music is like there obviously are like all of these advanced musical concepts happening but there and there's this sense of like comedy too there's this element of like there's this element of multi there's multiple things going on right it's like a visual element there's an audio element there's maybe a comedy element that's that's associated with the visual element but also it all seems so sincere to me too and and, and it seems um like you're saying it's like as an artist you're you're both a musician and you're also like a person that has a personality and and sometimes right. we don't let those things mesh it's like when i listen to your music and you know i i hear songs like uh mom and dad or nostalgia or i want to see my friends you know it's like those are those to me give me a look into like your your soul right and like like lewis cole's song phone or like the, plenty of thundercats music i feel the same way like i get I get to have fun, but then also I get to like actually know you guys as as people too, which I think is a really cool thing. Thanks, man. That means a lot. Um, I, I do think being sincere with your music is important. Coming from an honest place and being as transparent as you possibly can is the most fulfilling way to put your own music out. Because if you feel like you need to fit a certain mold, then you're going to be trying to cater to certain people and do things a certain way that might not necessarily feel true to who you are. Yeah. So, but regardless of what kind of music people like, people can always uh, acknowledge and recognize something that's honest and and pure. So you can't, I don't, you can't really go wrong by just being 100% true to yourself and in, in your music. Yeah. Was that, was that a process for you? Was that a difficult, like, you know, I remember you saying something like, uh, I used to only, I went to school because I wanted to sound like Chris Potter and now I just want to play smooth jazz in my underwear or something like that. Like, <laughs> like, what, like was that a transition for you from being like, um, I, I have to be very serious all the time to being like, no, I'm playing some serious shit, but also like, here's my personality too. Was that a, tra- was that a process for you? Yeah, definitely. It definitely was. Um, and it really started at the pan- at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I... I think being isolated and not having a lot of people around to either validate or criticize what I was doing was actually really helpful to figure out what I really wanted and what Mm. I really enjoyed doing. Um, And before the pandemic, I actually didn't even own a microphone or know how to use Logic before the pandemic. No shit. Yeah, so... I, I had moved to New York on March 1st, 2020, which was obviously the worst possible week <laughs> to ever move to New York. Yeah. Um, but I just had this fire. I was like, I had this momentum. I, I, I was determined to do something. And obviously that fire got put out with, you know, I couldn't really go out and do things in New York, but I still wanted to do something. So I kind of directed that energy towards, okay, I'm going to figure out how to record myself and produce things and make videos from home yeah. and just kind of tinkering around in that department really gave me some insight into who I was as an artist. And like I just said earlier, not being able to like be around all these people and have to present myself a certain way at this gig and a certain and a different way at this gig and like have to wear a suit and tie to this wedding. And then, this gig is like a bar gig and I can be more casual. Like I could kind of just focus on being one version of myself. And for me, that was really helpful in figuring out exactly what I want to say with my music. Yeah. That's so interesting, man, because like, especially as jazz musicians, I think we get locked in this mode of like, I got to say yes to every gig. And if it's a polka gig or if it's a jazz gig or if it's a big band gig or if it's a funk gig or if it's a wedding gig it's like i gotta say yes because i gotta make money 
And so you're, con- you're like you're saying it's like you have to be this chameleon. Um, and it's re- it's interesting that you got um, it's like it's a interesting perspective on the pandemics to be able to really isolate and then explore who you are as an artist. Um, I'm su- I'm a little surprised that you didn't know how to use DAWs before before the pandemic uh was it like you were just like i just want to be amazing at saxophone and that was all you cared about for a while yeah pretty much i like i said i just was focused on that and focused on freelancing and gigging and that was really what i was putting most of my effort into yeah um i was actually this is a funny story that i'm still kicking myself for um before the pandemic this was like october of 2019 we Corey did a session at Universal Audio in Santa Cruz. And for the band, the compensation was 10 free UA plugins, which at the time I was like, oh, I don't give a shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't even have a microphone. Like, right. <laughs> what am I going to do with it? What is a plugin? I don't even know. So I was like, ah, forget it. And then fast forward a few months, I'm getting really into production and I have logic and I'm like searching, like, all right, what are the best plugins? And and I was, I reached out to Jake, Corey's uh, tour manager at the time, and was like, dude, is there any chance I can still take UA up on that offer? And he's like, yeah. sorry, that, sh- that ship has sailed. I was like, oh, I had no. no idea how valuable that was at the time. Yeah, man, that's interesting. So did you, for Sam, for Sam Greenfield Sucks, your new album, uh, I, I saw that I, th- I think Corey maybe mixed a couple tracks from that. Did, did Corey do everything? Did you do some of it? He mixed the whole thing, yeah. Mixed the whole thing, okay. Yeah, I'm getting more confident in mixing, but I'm not at the point where I would feel comfortable mixing my own stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that I'm trying to work on now, too, is like trying to mix my my stuff. I I get asked to do a lot of like remote record, and then I can just send a a wave, and it's like I don't have to deal with mixing things. But now that I'm piecing together songs, playing bass and keyboards and trumpet, it's like, okay, how do I actually... It's actually a super fun part of the music that feels like you're unlocking right like that we've listened to recordings our whole lives and it's like for for whatever reason you know i went to jazz school it's like for whatever reason you go to jazz school and nobody says you should learn how to mix things which seems so backwards it's like man this is the whole industry now i know um, you just never really even think about it and then you're just faced with it it's such a daunting task when you have to start from scratch yeah yeah it's a, i think it's a fun uh fun problem to solve though i'm enjoying i'm enjoying working on it and like i said before we started recording it's like I should probably get into Logic because I think that stuff's easier on Logic than it is on Pro Tools, or at least plugins and things like that seems to be. Anytime I try to use plugins or virtual instruments, it's way harder on Pro Tools than it is on Logic. Really? Seems that way. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I don't know. Uh, I wanted to ask you too. You know, like s- turning back the tables of time here. I- I've seen your parents have like come up on stage and played some music on some of Corey's shows. It's like a fun yeah. little thing. So you grew up in a musical house uh you know how much did your parents influence your decision to to chase music was it always just this encouragement to to do what you want to do uh how how big was that influence for you it was huge um i i mean i i feel like i i captured it as best as i could in that song you brought up mom and dad i mean they were just so encouraging ever since I decided I wanted to be, be a musician, it was almost like I, that was like the only thing I could do. And they were just so supportive of it because they're musicians themselves. Yep. And I was always surrounded by music. My mom's a music teacher. Um, my dad has his degree in, in musicology. Um, they're both very well studied and, and proficient in music. So I was just surrounded by it since I was born. And I, I, I think I picked up the sax when I was around six and my mom just, she would get me piano lessons, sax lessons, whatever lessons I wanted to take. She, she made sure that, that it happened. Um, and yeah, they, they never said anything about like, Hey, maybe you should think about getting a real job or think right. about getting a degree in something that is lucrative. They just said, sure, go for it. You know, that's awesome. It's awesome. You know, I was looking, uh, I was like doing some research leading up to this and I, I was looking at your website and I was I went to your bio. I was like, I'm just gonna read his bio to see if I can find out where he goes to school. <laughs> what your is bio, my bio is like, I like saxophone. Just leave me alone and go listen to my music or whatever. <laughs> your bio. <laughs> Who cares? Go go listen to my music. 
Oh um, man, I forgot curi- about that. Yeah, yeah, okay, which is great. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> it, what, uh, like, where, where did you go to school? What, what, what took you from you know high school, Sam, loving saxophone, into like your pre-professional uh, career? It's kind of a, it's kind of a whirlwind of a story, to be honest. Um, so I dropped out of high school in the beginning of my senior year and i just me me in public school did not get along wow i just was not about that life um which i don't regret that for a second because i really do think that everybody has a unique way of learning things and the at least in america the public education system has a very concrete way like just cookie cutter everybody learns things the exact same way yep approach to teaching people and it just didn't sit with me so i uh you know after skipping school a lot um i don't want this to encourage anybody to to do what i did (laughs) don't skip school (laughs) do what feels right for you but uh yeah i ended up dropping out and i moved to israel on my own and i went to this music school there called ramon school of music um it was a sister school with berkeley uh and i was told when i auditioned that the classes would be in english but they were in hebrew which i hardly spoke at all wow um so a lot of the times they were teaching the classes in english just for me and i felt so bad because it was just a whole class of israeli people and they were speaking english for my sake only my goodness um but when I was there, I just was blown away at how amazing everybody was because I had been surrounded by, I mean, when you're in high school, you've only seen so much of the world. You haven't really been out on the scene, at least for most people, you haven't really been out on the scene. You, you haven't gone to the jam sessions. You haven't yep. gone to other cities to see what the musicians are like there. So I was kind of, you know, closeted in the suburbs and didn't really get to see what it was like out there. And uh, I was blown away and it just, that's where I feel like I learned how to practice and how to develop a good work ethic. Um, so I started practicing when I was out there pretty hard for the first, like efficiently, efficiently practicing for the first yeah. time. And then I moved back around March and I got my GED and I applied at this, I applied at a few schools. It was pretty late in the game to apply to colleges uh, so I could only, the only places still accepting applications were Berkeley, Manhattan School of Music, and University of the Arts. And I got into all three, but the only place that, I, got, I ended up getting a full ride to University of the Arts. And nice. I just felt, I, even then, I, I knew how how much debt people could go into going to school. So I was like, if I'm going to become a musician, I don't want to risk going 150 grand into debt. Yeah, I might as well go. I'm at I'm at uh, I'm at one thirty right now, man. Uh, You know, I keep telling younger students, I'm like, maybe don't go to a private school and take out a bunch of loans. You know, yeah, especially if you're going to go into the arts, man. Weigh your options before you make any concrete decisions. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's like that's almost touching on like public school systems failing us too. It's like they kind of route you there, right? It's like you're you're supposed to go to these prestigious schools you're supposed to take out loans and then you'll just pay them back when you're done right you're going to get a jazz trumpet degree man you'll be fine uh it's it's just so right it seems so silly and somebody like you that's so brilliant to to have the public school system not you know i I would people that listen to this podcast have heard me talk about this but i've I've read this book outliers recently by malcolm yeah i read that i read that book yeah man it's so fascinating to, to hear about your experience with public education and the way that they talk about that, you know, he talks about IQ levels and like uh, affirmative action, like all of these various different things that have to do with public education that were so interesting to me. Uh, and uh, and I've also been reading some other books that talk about how they're basically just training. We're basically just training workers in the system, right? And the education system's like what a hundred years old or something, a little more than a hundred years old in terms of educating the masses, educating everybody. Uh, it's just a big experiment that that maybe isn't isn't going so great (laughs) yeah no i i agree i uh i i think that especially now in the age of information 
there are alternate alternate routes to educating yourself. You could literally go to YouTube University yeah. and learn so much more, so much faster on your own schedule. Yep. That's not to say you should do this or you should do that, but I do think that in this day and age, there's there's other options. Yeah, and you just went and got your GED and you still were accepted to a bunch of schools. I mean, that's a perfect example of, it's like, hey, if you're able to just do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah, again, like, yeah, I'm not encouraging anybody to drop I will say, it was like my GED test, it was literally two plus two equals four type questions. I was wow. blown away. I was like, I could have done this in seventh grade. I would have been fine. <laughs> Um, so Israel, t- I want to talk a little bit more about Israel. Um, so you, you grew up in, you're Jewish, you grew up in a Jewish household. Is that part of like, I, you, you knew a little bit yeah. of Hebrew when you went in? Did you have to do a, a, a bar mitzvah and, and learn a little Hebrew for that he- Hebrew for that? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a Jewish household. It was by no means a super religious household. Um, yeah. we celebrated the Jewish holidays and everything, but we weren't super strict or conservative about anything. Um, I, but growing up Jewish in America, you go to Hebrew school, you learn all these prayers for your bar bat mitzvah, but the thing is you have no idea what the words actually mean. And okay. it's all Old Testament Hebrew, so it's not even common uh, modern Hebrew Yeah, the way they speak it today. So you're kind of just saying these syllables that you've memorized rather than knowing anything that you're actually saying right so my hebrew skills when i went to israel were extremely basic like like, hello how are you type type vibe wow and you were still able i mean it's they they taught the classes in english i guess that so that's how you were able to to do it yeah Uh, everybody everybody spoke english there which i always feel bad as an american it's like you can just always just rely on other people to speak your language and and other people coming to America have it so much harder because they have to immerse themselves in a country where nobody speaks their language. Right. So we, they can't just default to their native language and have us understand it. Like they really have to learn English. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've been all over with different bands and I'm always trying to speak the language and and people are always like, yeah, let's just speak English, man. It's gonna be fine, you know. Yeah, exa- exactly. I'll just it's speak like, your language. It's fine, you know. It's, this I'm conversation trying, will go way but, quicker uh, if we just speak English. Yeah, right. Um, I you know I wanted to ask too about Jewish music is I think s- such a a big part of uh, of the history of jazz music. It's like the, they're very intertwined, right? George Gershwin was Jewish, and a lot of his tunes. I, I did a show called The Soul of Gershwin that was written by this guy Joe Voss, who's big in the Jewish community in Minneapolis. And he talked a lot about, and we had like a traditional Jewish cantor who was a part of the show, and then a, like a jazz singer who was a part of the show. And they would do songs side by side from uh, from like traditional cantor music to uh, songs that Gershwin wrote. And there was a lot, there were a lot of similarities in the melodies. So he was like taking some melodies from traditional Jewish music and putting them in his music. Um, and then of course you got like John Zorn doing his thing, uh, with Dave Douglas, you know, around that time doing the, the, that, that klezmer style jazz. Did, did you play klezmer when you were in Israel? Is that, is that the music that's happening over there? Were you just focusing on jazz music? Has klezmer music ever kind of overlap with what you do is that any is that on your radar at all i i've attempted in certain jewish wedding bands to like fake my way through playing klezmer but by no means would i call myself an authentic klezmer musician because that is such a it's kind of similar similar to how uh similar to how somebody who's like played pocket their whole life tries to play swing and it's not as simple as just da, 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 da. Right. you know there's such a there's so many layers and it's so much deeper than that so i you know there's like a surface level klezmer and then there's like a really deep tradition of klezmer that i never really penetrated but it hasn't been to be honest it hasn't been a huge influence on me um and i don't know how prevalent it really is in Israel because I was kind of in this jazz school where that was the primary focus. Um, so I'm sure they might be better at it than your typical American musician, but yeah. uh, I don't. It's not. It's not like they're not like eat, sleeping, and breathing klezmer music out there. Right. Right. 
So that was mostly like they're just studying jazz music over. That was like a jazz school or a music school in general. It was a it was a jazz school, and the thing they were killing the yeah. musicians there were uh, there's something in the drinking water in Israel because there's so many ridiculous virtuosic musicians there, and I think a big part of it, sim- and this kind of ties into what we were saying about just how the public education system has it all laid out for you. You're supposed to graduate high school and then immediately go into college without really thinking about what you want to do. Yeah. Um, but in Israel, every person has to join the army as soon as they're 18 and wow. spend a minimum of, I, I don't want to get this wrong, but I, I want to say two years, two or three years in the army before they go to college. Yep. And at that age, between the ages of 18 and 20, it's such a, there's so, there's such formative years. Um, I mean, not, not like the ages of two to four or anything, but you right. know, 18 to 20 is a different type of formidable year. And, yep. uh, so much, you can figure out so much about what you want to do and, and just feel better about making a decision like music school and committing to it when you're 20 even even though it's only two years after you're 18, I feel like these people went to music school because they really wanted to learn about music. Yeah, yeah. Where I think and when a you lot go of the military, you're confronted with life and death type ideas. I mean, you're you, you're you're faced with reality. You're faced with the world and the reality of life and death, and that's any that's going to be something that's going to motivate you to do what you love. I would think uh, when you're when you're out of that, you know. Yeah. And and in addition to that, if you're joining the army, you probably learn some pretty strong work ethic skills. Yeah. And that was definitely applied to their practice re- regimen and just their music studies in general. They were they were very studious. Yeah, cool. Man, uh let's talk let's talk a little bit about the 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 new album. I've been listening to it a bunch, um getting ready to talk to you. Uh and it's great, of course. It's great. Uh, Kids Bop, is that Kids Bop? So, who did you do the horn arrangement on that? That sounds to me that sounds so much like a Mike Nelson horn arrangement. Having played his arrangements, for, yeah. for years, is that is that you that did that arrangement? Yeah, yeah. Cool. I I arranged all of that. I I will say it probably was subconsciously inspired by Michael Nelson, having been to Michael Nelson boot camp for the past few years. Right. Um, I was probably influenced by that. Um, I would, you know, I would go as far to say as I was definitely influenced by that. I wasn't consciously thinking about it as I was doing it, but it probably played a big role in, in how it came out. It sounds great, man. It's so funky and it's, you know, it's great to hear. Is that Mike on trombone on that track too? It is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then Lampley takes the most ridiculous trumpet solo. John oh Lampley, God. man. Woo. That dude is a national treasure. Coming out of that, it's like it. What I love about it is it's this like cute little melody, right? And it's like, oh, what's this song? This is cute. Eh. <laughs> and then it's just like the nastiest, funkiest horn thing in the middle of it with this, these ridiculous solos, and then back to this cute little melody. You know, was, the, <laughs> was that on purpose? Like, were you trying to go like, oh, let's juxtapose like the funkiest stuff with this uh, cute little thing? I I I don't know. I, there's not really much of a game plan when I sit down and write. Yeah. things just kind of happen how they happen uh so and a lot of the time i'll write certain sections completely separate from each other and then realize a week later that oh these two things actually fit nicely together and then i'll figure out how to piece them together and make a full full song out of it so that that was what happened with that i think i wrote the little cute melody first and then i just started working on that horn arrangement for fun and then realized that it worked as a segue from that other melody yeah yeah man it's so cool and deep uh thanks dude it's been really fun really fun to listen to that uh this the whole record in in general you, you you're like pitching things up too right i think i saw an instagram post where you had pitched up all your saxophones but you're doing that with your voice too like how did how did that how did you start doing that and, and why <laughs> honestly I don't know if I pitched anything up on this album. I did on my first album on uh, I'll Never Smile Again. That was all pitched up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the uh, little kid voice? The, you got a little kid voice, right? Isn't that, is that oh, you pitched yeah. up on one track? Yeah, that was... Uh, 
I used the plug-in little Alter Boy. Oh, okay. From uh, Sound Toys. Yeah, that's the um, the 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 bad day, good day thing, right? That what is that song called? Just oh, just know. one of those days. Yeah, yeah, one of those days. That's right. Just one of those days. <laughs> that's great. I played it for my brother when we were hanging out in Pittsburgh, and he was like, "Man, this is wild." <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for spreading the love, dude. Yeah, man. Yeah, um, he, he owns I, a couple of restaurants, so he's always spinning music. I tell him to. Oh, that's what's up. Him. Where does he live? Uh, Illinois. He he he, uh, he went to Western Illinois University, and then he just lives in in Macomb now, where Western is. And he runs two. He runs uh, chicks. He's actually about to become an owner, which is really exciting. He's been he's been GMing there for years and helping them open up multiple locations. But he's totally crushing it. It's a place called Chicks on the Square. It's a chicken. It's a chicken joint. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'll have to check it out if I'm in Illinois. Yeah. So I, I'm curious how uh, how how pitching things up. Like you were just experimenting, just screwing around. Oh, so. It really, I mean, I, I'd say a lot of interesting things happen when you learn something in an unconventional way, because when you're left to your own devices, you end up stumbling upon things that you might have not learned or found out if you took a tutorial or a course online. Right. So my method to learning logic and production was a lot of trial and error and just experimenting, messing around. Um Figuring out like, oh, okay, I could just, oh, you know where the the speeding thing up specifically that that came from. Uh, do you know Ben Levin? He's a good friend of mine. He's on YouTube. Don't no. You should check him out. He's got like one of my favorite YouTube channels. Cool. I'm gonna I've, die. It's it's he's he's probably like the most unique human being I've ever met in my life. Um, so get ready for a wild time if you watch his videos. <laughs> But uh, he was doing this thing during the pandemic called fake guitar and fake sax. And essentially what he was doing was recording things at half speed and then putting them into Reaper and doubling the speed. So the song would sound like it was the right tempo and the right pitch, but you could still tell that it had been sped up because there's a sound that happens when you speed something up. Even if you're right. speeding it up to a regular tempo, you can tell that there's something weird with it. So this was like a hit, like didn't hip hop producers do this in in Atlanta? Wasn't that a thing like down south where they were like that? Maybe they were some of the first hip hop. I was watching this uh, hip hop documentary on Netflix, and they were talking about this how they would record things half speed and then speed it up. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. That maybe that's where he got it from. I would be interested to hear which hip hop artist did that. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember a couple producers. I think it was, I think it was producers in Atlanta that did it. Um, but I cool. I mean, I, I know like Madlib is. is of course a very distinct rapper, yeah. but but you know he just pitches it up. Yeah, I don't think he records it at half half speed. But yeah, I think it was like a '90s thing. It was like using using actual gear, you know, using actually har- hardware to do it. Uh, yeah, as well. There's just something. I mean, what I realized. Okay, another thing that happened is sometimes uh, I'll turn on my Apollo, my my interface, and for some reason the bit rate is different than the audio that I'm listening to. So it will play at like one and a half times speed. Yeah, completely involuntarily. So I remember like I opened up one of the songs I was working on, and I couldn't figure out like why I was playing like way faster and way higher. But I loved it. I was like, this feels <laughs> so good. Yes, that's the moment. That's it, man. That's it. Yeah. And then I went back to listening to the regular version. I was like, man, this is boring now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I missed the fast version. Uh, it, it's so it, it got I got really into just experimenting with how to how to mess around with stuff like that. Yeah, cool. Dude, I'm curious about how uh, just to nerd out on music a little bit. Um, the The way that you come up with chord progressions like your the the way that you treat harmony seems it's just feels so modern to me i I don't know if there's a better word for modern has been used for so long (laughs) for so many decades (laughs) but it it feels so today to me um and what like how are you approaching writing tunes are you just screwing around do you have certain uh specific relationships between chords that you like to screw around with yeah i there's a few things I try and keep in mind. Um, one being, is there a common note throughout all the chords I'm playing? Um, because if there is, you can write a really easy 
singable, accessible melody uh. over a lot of chord changes. And it kind of tricks the listener into thinking that they're listening to something more simple than it actually is. Right. Um, you know, for instance, on just one of those days, like there's a lot of chord movement in there, but it's literally like da 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 It's like I'm just singing one note. Right, and right. So my I guess something I try and make a goal before writing any song is how can I make this harmonically stimulating for a musician while also making it accessible to a non-musician or somebody who wouldn't ordinarily listen to something with a lot of chord changes. Yeah, yeah. And what I've found is having a common tone throughout most of the chords you're playing. Or like, I also think bass movement is really crucial because while people aren't necessarily paying attention to the bass movement at the forefront of their mind, it's such a subconscious thing. Like if you have a bass movement that's very cohesive and moving like do 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 it's just it makes that makes sense but if you're like do 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 it's just kind of all over the place even if the chords are cohesive with themselves the bass movement is just such a glue yeah to make something easier to remember and sing Man, that's so cool. I know I, I saw a video you posted recently where you were like, here's an experiment. Try trying different bass notes under each chord or whatever. And you're like, Dude, <laughs> glad you read it. I'm glad you read it in that nerdy voice in your yeah. head. You're like, here's an experiment. <laughs> here's an experiment. <laughs> we'll fix my glasses. Uh, yeah, I love it, man. That's that's uh, that's it's really cool. Um, Thanks, dude. It's really cool to hear about about your process a little bit. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm over here like I should be taking notes. Uh but comment the common tone thing, you know, I started messing around with that a bunch um, after I started listening to to Glasper more. I don't know that like Glasper was the first one to do that, but it, I I remember just hearing so much of like hammering on a B flat and going through all these different right. changes, you know. Right, for sure. Yeah, yeah. He definitely he kind of uh that was a I feel like it was a very innovative approach to to modern jazz. I yeah. don't. I mean, I'm I don't know if he was the first to do that, but he definitely was one of the first to find mainstream success doing that. Yeah, totally. So how did the, um, you did the tiny desk with Ed Sheeran. How, how does something like that happen uh, for somebody like, for somebody like you? So for any freelancer, it's like, man, I would love to someday do a, something like that. How did that come together for you? Um, I don't know if you know a trombone player, Ray Mason, um, Ray Mason but no. he's a great friend of mine and he is really well connected in pretty much every department of the industry. Uh, so he, Adam Blackstone was contracting that gig and he, and then Ray was kind of like a subcontractor. So Adam hired Ray to then hire a horn section. Wow. And Ray hit me up to do it. And he was like, yo, are you free this date? It's for an artist. I can't say who until it's solidified. But, and I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he was like, okay it said Sharon, and i was like okay yeah cool. nice did, did you get to meet and talk with him do you, do you feel like more work could come out of that or was that like just a one-off kind of jam i'm not sure yet i i did get to meet with him i don't i mean i know his tours and his shows are pretty stripped down i know he's oh, yeah. always kind of worked like that but i know also a lot of artists get bored and want to spice things up so horns are a great way to do that hopefully he goes that direction but the unfortunate reality of the industry is that horns are the last to come and the first to go right you know right so they're they're always Even still a, the today, cherry on top you know i feel like we go we ebb and flow a little bit like you know early 2000s there weren't horns in anything it was like nothing it was all just like over super overproduced pop music and i do feel like we're in this area now where horns are present in a lot more stuff you see bruno using horns a bunch like major pop artists using horns and uh you know i guess that you know did, be, being able to work with ed sheeran i suppose like yeah there's a possibility like hey let's use horns but but i do feel like we're in an area do you feel the same way like where horns are being used yeah. a lot more by artists you know people I, I, I mean, this bands like Corey wong too it's like that are really reaching some serious heights that are heavy heavy horn bass 
Yeah, absolutely. The and the thing is, in a band like Corey's, the horns they can't be a track or a keyboard part. They have to be horns. If he's going to play those songs, they they have to be horns. Whereas in a lot of other pop artists' music, uh, I think they're looking at horns as oh that that can be a track or that can be the keys can just have a horn patch on and right and hammer that out synth because it's way cheaper than hiring three people and bringing them on the road that's not to say they don't have the budget to do that yeah (laughs) but uh i i I hope that it becomes the cool thing to do to have horns on stage because i mean horns are dope horns are a great vibe and nobody's ever been upset to see a horn section on stage you know right totally yeah um yeah man you know i want to talk to you a little bit about uh so part of the part of the reason for doing this podcast is to is to talk to artists about how they're how they're making it like how they've created how they've how they've pieced out a, a, a piece of the industry for themselves and look just looking at your spotify numbers alone um how did you get to where you are like you started releasing your original tunes you're at like a 94,000 a little almost 95,000 monthly listeners um Man. are are you like I talked to a buddy of mine who like wakes up every morning and he emails playlist owners and he tries to kind of get real boots on the ground and that's how he built it up was it like you just released some badass music and people found it or are you actually like actively working on building those numbers Yeah no I I mean it's it's a combination of both I feel like first and foremost the music you're putting out has to be valid and and worth it Yeah um and then if it's good enough and you market yourself strategically, then good things will happen if the product is worth it. And so that's my first focus is, okay, I want to make sure that these songs that I'm putting out there are worth being in a playlist and worth editorial consideration. Um, and then, you know, you can pitch singles that that's like, that's been the huge debate in the past couple of years has been what is more beneficial to just put out singles because on Spotify, which is just inevitable. That is the place where most people listen to music. So you really yep. have to think about that. If you're going to put yourself out there on Spotify, you can pitch every single to an editorial listener, uh playlister. So Every single you have the chance to put it in front of somebody who can make a good decision for your music hmm. and put it in front of potentially millions of people. And the big debate has been, and, and the thing is, you can only do that on singles. You can't do that for like every song on your album unless you pitch every song on the album as a single. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people's methods has been exclusively releasing singles to increase their chances of getting on an editorial playlist, which puts you in front of a lot more people. That said, a lot of musos, myself included, really enjoy the process of sitting down with an album. Yep. So I don't want the industry standard to change from albums to singles. But the unfortunate reality is the more singles you can put out, the better chances you'll have of being put in front of millions of people on Spotify. Uh, so I chose three. So the way the way I'm kind of trying to hack this system is on Sam Greenfield Sucks, my last album, I pitched... Th- th- so you can pitch... I put out three singles before the album dropped. And then on the day your album drops, you can pitch one more single that's on the album. So I, w- I was able to pitch a total of four songs on the album. There you go. And... Thankfully, I I got I don't know if it's luck or whatever, but I ended up all of the songs I pitched got playlisted for the first time. And, wow, man! And I, I was really pumped about that. And that's that's it's it's kind of like an art figuring out how to pitch your tune because they like I think there's something upwards of like sixty thousand songs get uploaded to Spotify every single day. Yep, and these editorial playlisters have so much music to sift through. So you have to kind of figure out, all right, what am I going to do to make my song stand out to them? And it's kind of like, how do I make the most captivating pitch? So you choose like, what mood is the song? What 
culture does the song come from? What are two genres that you would label this song as? Yeah. Uh, and then at the end, you you get to write like 350 characters about what your song brings to the table. And I'm just kind of experimenting with the best approach to that part of it. Because if you can use the right buzzwords and let's say you're like featuring like on my last one, I, I just released a single two days ago with Mark Lettieri. Yep. And you know, it doesn't hurt to drop the name Mark Lettieri in the pitch because right. they're like, okay, Snarky people puppy. like that guy. Yeah, exactly. So you can like, write Like, Oh, this band features Mark Lettieri, the guitar hero. And you know, there's other snarky puppy adjacent musicians in the band. And it's like a perfect blend of jazz fusion with funk. So if you like say the genres of music that it is, it helps them to decide like, oh, maybe because he said fusion, it will fit well in this jazz fusion playlist. Right, right. Um, instead of like completely just being like, do you like music? Well, this song is music. Like sure. you need to get specific <laughs> about what what it is. Um, but another way I'm kind of trying to hack how, because I thought there were a few songs, few, there were a few more songs in the album I would have liked to pitch as singles, but I didn't want to release like eight singles. Yeah. Um, so what I did is I recorded live versions of the singles in the studio with a full band. And then I'm going to release a live EP in uh, a few, I guess it will have been released by the time this drops. So I'm okay <laughs> talking yeah. about it here. But cool. uh, I did a lot of those songs that I wanted to pitch on the original album in this, and I'll be able to have a chance to pitch them now Okay. in, in this new form. Cool. And so, you know, I think I read this in the interview that you gave where you, you talked about how a lot of this music was made like in your bedroom by yourself and really the magic of and, and why you fell in love with music was to play with other people. So your intention was to bring this music to bands and actually play it with bands. And, and, and of, of course, you've been doing that now. How's that been going? It's been great. It's been really fun. There was a part of me that was like, when I figured out that I could make a whole album without leaving my room and just like Frankenstein it together by having people send me tracks, I was like, oh, why would I ever do anything else? I can just yeah. do it like this. <laughs> and then yep. I had a show and I played these songs for the band for the first time. I was like, oh, okay, this is what it could sound like when there's chemistry in the room and everybody's like feeding off each other. Yeah. Um, and I forgot about that. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's great. I think that's um, beautiful, man. It's like that's a that's a way of hey like this this electronic thing is never really going to replace at least not in the hearts of the musicians is never really going to replace playing with other people you know exactly that's not to say it's like that's it's still a very useful tool to have at your disposal to be able to like get tracks from people across the world yeah yeah uh, man, it's it's really interesting to hear about your Spotify approach too. And I think uh, there's a lot of artists that are coming up that are really trying to figure that that thing out. And uh, is there anything else that you're like? Obviously, you you plug a lot of time and energy into Instagram. Uh, are you on TikTok? Are there other technologies that you're trying to plug into to to build your thing? I mean, I'm trying to grow my YouTube. It's so hard. It's yep. such a difficult task because. You know, even if you do have a big following on Instagram, or it's just hard to get direct tra redirect traffic somewhere else because everybody's attention span is is so short. And I mean, I'm I'm the same way. My scrolling psychology is very mindless. Sometimes I'm just yeah. kind of like scrolling, and if somebody's like, "Hey, click this link to watch the full video," I'm like, "Ah, nah." <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like you're dealing with different audiences, right? You you have an Instagram audience that is you almost have to treat like its own thing and you can filter people from there to maybe spotify in an easier way but a youtube is like its own animal almost yeah you because you like when you're watching youtube you can't really especially on your phone youtube is you can't like text and scroll while you're on youtube right unless you're scrolling on youtube and have the video like in the corner but yep. when you close youtube the video closes so yep. when people decide to watch your music video on their phone they're deciding to spend five minutes with your music with their undivided attention. Yeah. Which, which is, is hard, a lot man. To that's ask. a tough it's a tough nut to crack, right? Very tough. So so that's I'm trying to do that. Um but as far as really putting myself out there, TikTok seems like it's an inevitable move that's gonna just keep climbing in popularity. I haven't cracked TikTok yet. Yeah. I just, I know what I have to do to make it happen. I know what, what has to be done. People, yeah. 
it's all about like duetting and collaboration, which is great. Um, and a lot of covers, it has to be like, they don't, I, I, I've noticed that like, I don't think TikTok really uh, celebrates original music as much as oh. they do. Like, here's me playing a sax solo over this outcast song. Right, right, right. Which is also really cool. That um, is cool. I've always liked not, the duet feature on TikTok. I do think it's a really cool platform. I don't use it a lot, but. Yeah, no, it, it's really cool. And I think some very dope collabs have happened through that as well. Yeah. Um, but my, I'm I'm still an Instagram boy and I've been reading a lot about just sponsored ads and targeting your mm. demographic because there's no shame in that. I feel like there's this stigma attached to sponsoring your stuff and yep. it's like oh you're cheating like no you're not because if a major retail company decided to say like you know what we're just not going to advertise you'd be like right. what, what's your problem why the hell wouldn't you advertise but for yep. some reason like musicians are expected to just grow organically we just can't it's like you're cheating by putting money behind some of your posts but what you can really accomplish with that is figuring out exactly who your demographic is through the analytics of that ad, figuring yeah. out the location of your fan base, figuring out the interests of your fan base, figuring out the age group of your fan base, and then really tapping into that. And then you know exactly what parameters to set for if you have a, a video that you're really proud of and you're like, I know that snarky puppy fans would love this video, then yeah. then you could literally pay 50 bucks and have your video put in front of thousands and thousands of snarky puppy fans. And like, where's the cheating in that? It's just a strategic yeah. move in my opinion. Right. And you know, in a lot of ways it's like you're, you're putting something in front of people that people actually want to see. There's so many ads that people don't, people don't want to see it's like anytime i get someone a musician ad in my instagram feed i'm always like oh do i follow this person like like cause I'll, right. cause I'll dig it a lot of times i'll dig it and then i'll i'll go and look at their profile and maybe follow them i mean it's a that is an interesting way of thinking about it i i have had that same feeling like oh i'm it's not that necessarily that you're cheating i don't know like it's almost like a self-conscious uh I, i'm putting i don't want to put myself out there i don't want to put money behind my thing and have people be looking and you know there's like right. this weird uh this is weird thing that i think a lot of artists have in the back of their mind like you're you're not worthy you shouldn't do that or or whatever you know this like self-doubt um that creeps in when as soon as you're like i'm gonna put 50 bucks behind an ad and kind of promote my music yeah you're kind of scared people are gonna be like oh look at sam trying so hard yeah <laughs> <laughs> like which is silly trying man is... it's like we're all just trying to make it <laughs> yeah exactly it's like so suddenly trying and effort has become like not cool yeah so what you know, you teach a little bit too. I see every now and then you're like, I've got some slots open this month. Um, what are you telling your students that want to be professionals? Uh, how how are you preparing them um, for the next step? Um, I mean, one of the questions I get the most from students who are still in college or about to go to college or have just graduated college and are kind of trying to make it as a freelancer in their city, one of the biggest questions I get from them is, you know how do you get gigs where like square yep. one what do you do and the the truth of the matter is you really just have to make your presence known if you want to play locally people in your city have to know who you are you have to be out yep. you have to be people have to know who sam greenfield is people have to know who adam meckler is otherwise if you're just locked up in the practice room you can you can get you can be the best but if nobody knows you exist, then that will only take you so far. So it's, you know, and, and the thing is, I know that doesn't come easily to a lot of people. I myself am somewhat introverted naturally. So yeah. that doesn't mean I don't like socializing with people, but sometimes it really does take effort to decide to go out and do something. Um, but, and, and with the internet, as a tool now, you can kind of get away with doing that a little less because if you're smart enough with your content, then you can make your presence known that way. Yep. Um, but as far as like gigging locally and becoming a freelance musician, you can sustain yourself. 
uh hit hit up the jam sessions hit up people you look up to for coffee uh just get together and hang be super nice don't vibe people um just be open and warm and uh and of course play your ass off um as a prerequisite to all of it right (laughs) yeah exactly but oftentimes people who don't even play their ass off but have all those other qualities will, will get hired first because absolutely they're easier to be around or they'll prepare the music more and yeah that's another thing you like come prepared to every situation i've uh thankfully i'm in so many situations like the Corey circles like it's just expected that whatever music is sent your way will be prepared by the time everybody gets to rehearsal so it's yeah. a rehearsal and not a practice right and that will get you the most work is if you just show up prepared and like you did your homework people will want you back um yeah man those are all great lessons yeah and i don't know it, it's really as simple as that i think i don't yep. think it's that deep yeah totally hey, so hey man uh to wrap it up like what do you what do you have coming up can we expect to see some touring at some point behind your own music or yeah you said you have an ep with all kind of live versions or like live band versions of some of your songs what what else is going on yeah i have some really really i have some stuff coming out i'm pretty happy with uh there's a few videos and i guess by the time this drops they'll be out so i can talk about them but i did this (laughs) session where uh every person in the band wore a skin tight green suit Ah, I um, saw a picture with you and Kaz. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, so that's going to be this session that's dropping. Awesome. Um, so pretty much what that was is every person was a human-shaped green screen. So I was able <laughs> to put whatever pictures or textures on their body that I wanted. So it it came out really unique. And awesome. I'm going to be rolling that out over the next few weeks. And then besides that, I'm here doing this uh, session in the UK with this acapella group, the Swingle Singers. Cool. And yeah, they're like this really, really cool acapella vocal group who actually started in the 60s. They were really big in the wow. 60s. And they've kind of, there's been new forms of them throughout the decades. And in their current form, they're trying to do like a pretty modern thing. And they tagged me on Instagram. They had transcribed the... Uh, the beginning of the banana song that nice crazy harmony yep. thing ah uh, yeah right yeah and i was like well you guys already did that much you might as well do the whole thing like i'll come Hell to the yeah. uk let's 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 do this and oh, yeah man, they did a whole cool. acapella arrangement so i'm gonna be doing that putting that out soon but that's more of a surprise so maybe maybe depending on when this drops just yeah. Maybe, maybe it'll be a mu- it'll out. be maybe a month. We've, I've got I've got a bunch in the can, so uh, there'll be a little bit of time. Maybe you'll have enough time to get it out. Yeah, <laughs> cool, man. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's great to hear from you and, and hear about all the awesome things you're doing, uh, dude. Thanks so much really for for thinking of me and having me, man. This this is it's great to chat. Yeah, of course, man. Enjoy the UK and your decompression. Thanks, brother. Yeah, man. All right. Peace. Peace.